Hi, I'm Jan Senzemir, a New Englander who has lived and worked all over the world, from Africa to Asia to Europe to the United States. I've worked as a Zen Buddhist and I've worked as an ecologist on issues of how do we face great uncertainty. I've tried with my science to unite non-scientists and scientists in coming to understand these problems together. Zen Buddhism and ecology might sound very different, but actually you might be surprised at the ways they could complement each other in dealing with the major dilemma of climate change. That dilemma is that we are not learning fast enough now in order to adapt to the changes coming our way. Climate change is starting to come on so strong, it's starting to terrify people. It's really almost like God knocking at the door, the way Beethoven introduced the Sixth Symphony. It might really look like God knocking on the door if the entire landscape is chasing you from your home, whether it's drought or flooding, sea level rise in Miami, or can you imagine having to leave your home on five minutes notice, drive like crazy through walls of fire and cringe on the beach waiting for your Navy to rescue you? Australians don't have to imagine it, they're living it. And they're starting to say things that we've heard all around the world. I no longer recognize my home. So how do we answer this knocking on the door? A lot of people are trying all kinds of bold experiments with their lifestyles, changing their diet, giving up flying, but you often are only scratching the problem with your lifestyle changes. If you lived in Arizona and you got an incredible rain harvester and you gave up swimming pools, 80% of the water in Arizona goes to agriculture. The entire industry has to change. You could try triple painting your windows, but most people don't own their homes and the landlord is not going to change that for you unless the laws change. That requires all of society to stand together. Then we can start restructuring everything. We need totally new networks for transport, for energy production and distribution, and housing. For that, we need all hands on deck. These numbers, though, can drown you. It sounds like you are being overwhelmed by someone else's story. This is our story, and we have to take charge of it. And I'd like to explain how we can do that. The challenge right now, and I can tell you this as a scientist, we're trying to outknow each other and throw facts at each other when actually nobody knows, not scientists, not politicians, how to live with climate change. We're frozen like a deer in the headlights and not learning fast enough because we don't trust each other and we're not willing to take risky experiments. We have some examples now in Europe and the United States of people playing with doing things like removing the dikes and removing dams to allow rivers to flood. Australians are finally consulting with Aborigines for their 20,000 years of experience in burning landscapes on purpose to take the danger down before there's a catastrophe. These are the kind of innovations we have to experiment with to find out how we can live with this kind of disturbance. For that, we have to essentially stand together and take big risks. Now, my family knows that ominous knocking at the door. My own grandmother was forcibly evicted from her house in the middle of the night in 1940, and she never saw her home again in Poland. But that knocking on the door can be very different if society is united with goodwill. Two years later in Moscow in 1942, that knock on the door did not mean that you might go to the Gulag. It meant the Nazi army is at the gates of the city and we need you out there now to help us fight it. And that same kind of goodwill that comes from a united society really benefited American soldiers three years later in France in 1945. One American army captain said, my job as a soldier was a lot easier because often the Germans when they saw we were Americans, would prefer to surrender because they knew we would give them a square deal. So how can we get to that? Many people who don't trust themselves often feel that the only way there is a charismatic leader like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who led the country during the Second World War. Sure, he was incredibly charismatic and was able to face down the biggest industrialist of the time, the head of General Motors. He said, sir, you're not listening to me. You are not gonna be making cars. You're gonna be making tanks and airplanes. Well, what was the real power behind his words? It wasn't the charisma. It was that all of society stood with him. 
So how can we now reach across the aisle and start uniting our society to achieve the kind of miracles that were achieved in the Second World War? Well, we can take the example of extremists who woke up and started coming back to the center of society. Many of them are helping other extremists to basically come back and start working with everybody. What they found is the first barrier, many extremists insulate themselves from their emotions by surrounding themselves with an armor of anger and hatred. We have to pierce that armor, not with facts. Hammering someone else with facts is counterproductive. It just raises the wall again. You hit them by going and touching their common humanity, friendship, family, a sense of that we need to do right by each other. The openness needed to do this, you have to trust yourself and you have to also learn how to trust others and work with them. Trusting yourself can come from a practice like Zen Buddhism, though there are hundreds of paths to practice openness. This is not something you learn in a book. Openness is something that comes from doing it. You understand it because it is what you do, not because some book told you to. And the practice of working with others, we have centuries of experience in science in learning how to hold a question and look deeply into questions. Many people can see some contrast between religion and science, but actually Zen Buddhism and science meet in the same place, a profound and honest questioning. I've worked with Zen masters, I've worked with Nobel laureates in science, and the great ones share one characteristic, and that is an almost innocent humbleness that makes them totally approachable. They honestly care about you and honestly want to know how you feel. With someone like that, you could work on the thorniest of questions. Let me give you an example of how this works. Why was the first Nobel Prize in economics that a woman would take given to someone who wasn't even an economist? Eleanor Ostrom was a political scientist but she was open enough to test a question everyone had ignored for 50 years. That question is based on the assumption, how do we manage our environment when local people can't be trusted? They're selfish and ignorant and they'll trash the environment. Eleanor actually looked the first time and she found all over the world, if local people were still united in their trust with each other, even without a formal education, they managed quite sustainably. Eleanor heard the knocking on the door and she didn't shy away from it. She actually opened the door and looked. We also, if we trust each other, can open the door and look and find ways to learn our way into the future. Then we'll see miracles like I saw in Western Sahara where 200 million trees appeared out of nowhere in 15 years from people lacking formal education, but finally learn to trust one another and achieve miracles. We can do the same.